When I was a boy, I learned a scripture. Lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of the ages. But now I have to confess that when I learned that scripture, I learned it as part of a joke. As reason why you're never supposed to fly in an airplane. Because Jesus said, lo, I will be with you always. Didn't say anything about up high, just, just low. And, and, and yet, that helped me, for whatever reason, remember that passage of Scripture from Matthew 28. I got wrecked this week when, uh, in my time of study, I realized I was making one specific mistake with that passage. I have rules on studying Scripture. If you've heard me much at all, you're familiar with at least one or two of the rules. Uh, The first is a text without a context is a pretext. That is, everything said has to be placed in the context of when it was said and how it was said and whom to who it was said. The second thing is, if you see the word therefore in a text, you're supposed to see what therefore is there for. The purpose. What's there for, therefore? And the one that wrecked me this week is the word and. Several significant texts, the promises of God from Hebrew Scripture and New Testament, we quote should begin with the word and. But nobody ever starts a conversation and it's connecting to something that's come before. But when we come to the promises of God, we have, I have, a bad habit of holding to the promise without looking what is the condition whereby the promise is made. Matthew 28, Jesus is ascending to be with the Father. All authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go into all the world. That sounds like a command in the English. In the Greek, it's more implied, understood. As you go, where you go, anytime you go, the command is make disciples. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all things And, lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of the ages. My point this morning is simple. If you have not felt the presence of God in your life, could it be that you're not helping in the matter of making disciples? For Jesus said, I'll be with you when you're making disciples. Baptizing, teaching, But the command is making disciples. And the text that we have today from Luke's Gospel, chapter 5, Jesus calls Simon, later called Peter. It's not the introduction to Simon. In the previous chapter, Jesus has healed Simon's mother-in-law in Simon's house. Yes, that was a miracle he didn't ask for, but he got it anyway. And... So he has begun his ministry, and now in chapter 5 at verse 1, Jesus continues in ministry and calls Simon. Now, one of the things that stands out to me is how this entire text is focused on Simon. Other people are present, but they're unnamed until the very end. And even at the end, Simon is the center of the focus. Now, not to get too geeky on you, When Jesus says, you will catch people, the you is second person singular, which means only you, just you. Jesus was talking to Simon. Why does it get included in the entire text of the gospel? Because there's something more important here than the idea that you could fish for people. And the idea is that whatever you do, do it in such a way 
that others want a relationship with God in Christ Jesus. Do it in such a way that God gets the benefit. And so the text. Once, while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he'd finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let your let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long, but have caught nothing. Pause there for a second. The word that gets translated as master means having to do with letters and is used for a teacher or especially a tutor. Now, Jesus has already been in Simon's home and healed Simon's mother-in-law. And so the two of them at least know each other, and Simon is at least familiar with Jesus as teacher and as healer. But I can't help but read that text as as Simon saying, now, now, your business is teaching. I'm the professional fisherman. And I have been out all night long and have caught absolutely nothing. It's almost like Jesus is hearing Simon say, now, now, you need to stay on your side of the road. I'm the fisherman here. Yet, yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And when they came and filled both boats so that they had began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Go away from me, Lord. Did you notice the change in title? He's no longer man of letters. He's now Kyrios, boss, Lord. Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid from now on you, individually, you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him, the word of God, for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Father, may the word of my mouth, the thought, the meditation, the heart of all here today be acceptable or in the name of Jesus become acceptable. You alone are our strength, our redeemer. Amen. In this living parable, as it were, Simon runs face to face with really who Jesus is. He's not just a man of letters. He's not just a miracle worker. He's Lord And Simon's response, get away from me. There is something about people, you and I, that when 
we run into the true presence of God, we're afraid of being destroyed. Go away from me, Lord. But he's not sent away. Instead, he's called by grace. Jesus, who knew everything there is to know, instead of sending Simon away, a sinner, tells him he's going to take him and turn him from what he had been doing to doing what he needs to do for God. And it's our calling as well. Whatever you do, wherever you are, however you go into the world, take and do it for God. Understand that, yeah, God knows who you are and what you are. God wants to use you anyway. I'm very reminded of the calling of Elisha in Hebrew Scripture. Elijah takes his outer garment, the mantle, and and slings it across to Elijah's shoulder. And that's the calling. But Elisha does something interesting there. He's farming. Now, you're familiar with this concept. He's out there farming. He's using an oxen to pull a wooden plow. Elisha doesn't just go follow Elijah. He slaughters the oxen, busts up the plow and builds a fire, roasts the animal over the fire, calls the neighbors together for a going away party for himself. Now, this is a man who does not intend to turn back from God's calling in his life. The text here says they left everything and they followed. Whatever you do, do it for God, but understand that he knows who you are, what you are, and he doesn't want you going back. Now, by the way, Simon does go back. In John's gospel, the last chapter, after having met the risen Jesus, Simon goes back to fishing. And Jesus does what? Calls him again. Once God gets his hands on you, he just doesn't want to let go. And the miraculous catch of fish is done a second time. And Peter, for a second time, recognizes who Jesus is. But the point is, our life as followers of Christ is to do what we do, whatever it is, in such a way that others want the relationship we have with God to be, as it were, contagious in our Christianity. Why is it that Jesus needs disciples anyway? The text says that the crowds come and they press in on him. He's giving them the word of God. Can I tell you there's never going to be a layoff in the kingdom of God? When I grew up in my grandfather's day, it was not at all uncommon for a person to work their entire life from one employer doing the same thing their entire career. When daddy came along, it was not uncommon if a person would change jobs but stay within the same career. Maybe change jobs two, three times, bettering themselves in a better position. And now I'm told that on average you will change careers two or three times in a work life from multiple companies. We have layoffs. We can remember the people in this room when there were factories where there are no longer factories, buildings where there are no longer buildings, jobs where there are no longer jobs. There will never be a layoff in the kingdom of God because people hunger for God. Whatever you do, do it for God. In the text today, Jesus is preaching, he's teaching, he's doing miracles, he's healing, and the crowds press in such that he can't speak from land. He gets in the boat and puts out a little bit so that becomes his platform. And then he lives out this parable in front of us by calling Simon. And the focus is laser sharp on Simon to the point that he doesn't even name the other people until very late in the story. It's a singular story. But it's a story from which we can all gain knowledge. 
I have several images of the church that I love. One is the body of Christ. If you've heard me pray at all, you've heard me pray that at some point that God would uh, uh, help us to be the very physical presence of Jesus in our community. That's what it is, in my opinion, to be the body of Christ. You know, we are physically what Jesus is when we're present. And one of the other images that I dearly love is, is the bride of Christ. Maybe it's this upcoming uh, second honeymoon that's got me thinking about marriage or something. I'm not sure what it is. But I've been thinking about marriage. But one of the things about the bride of Christ, you know, I'm 60. I'm not expecting babies. I'll, I'm going to just be honest with you. I'm not. But young people, when they marry, if they're both healthy, unless something is done to prevent, if they're both healthy, after marriage, in the not-too-distant future, somebody's pushing a baby carriage. And I look around, I say, where are the baby Christians? Are we not spending enough time with as the bride of Christ with the groom? Is something happening that we're not healthy, that babies are being produced? Here in this text today, Jesus is pointing very clearly that whatever you do, however you live your life, you can do it in such a way that the gospel goes forth. Why does he need disciples? Because he's been successful. There's not going to be layoffs in the kingdom. And quite frankly, Jesus is just one person. When we talk about Jesus here on earth, we use that fancy word incarnation, which I've previously helped you understand is a word that simply means in the flesh. But in the flesh, flesh, Jesus is one person can be at one place at one time. There's a limitation to the incarnation and to overcome that limitation today and this day Jesus calls those who would follow him and he has us become what he is those that carry out the gospel those that live it in such a way that others want that relationship with God whatever you do fish or anything else do it for God this day part of the the reason I call this a living parable Jesus has him put out in the deep in other words get in over your head one of the guarantees I can make is that if you do follow God one of the ways you know it's God that you're following is you get in over your head that's a good place to say amen you get in over your head And that's when you find out that really God's grace is sufficient. That God can take care of what we cannot in over our head. The calling. Do what you do in such a way that others want the relationship you have with God. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen.